stable fiscal position where we're getting a fair share for oil, where we've got diversified revenues, and where we're able to take advantage of the expansion of Alaska's non-oil economy, because it has been expanding. But <laughs> unfortunately, we, well, I say unfortunately, we're still going to have to negotiate with the Senate, which has made it clear that uh, increasing the funding of education is not one of their top priorities. Liz Rains with KTVA. Does the House have 21 votes to pass the income tax? Uh, we're working on it. Um, you know, our message all session has been that uh, we don't hold our members to individual votes and uh, we do build a consensus and uh, uh, when we get to the floor, we certainly will have the support for it. Uh, conceptually, um, I think our caucus is very much in support of the components of House Bill 115 and in terms of uh, you know, indiv individual headcount, I think we're premature to uh, assign any um, you know, uh, uh, numbers in terms of uh, our members and our caucus, but the bill really is still in its formative stage. It's still working its way through the House Finance Committee. We're just quite not there yet. And, and I would like to say that on if you ask the question, would you have just for an income tax, that's a different question than would you have votes for a balanced a program that does the whole project. That's what we are trying to attempt, is make sure that we tie things together so that we come out with a balanced, fair plan. So, you know, the majority in the House last year couldn't even get POMV and dividend reduction out of finance to get to the floor. So there wasn't support for that individual element either, and no one in the majority this year was really willing to vote for that bill as a standalone only solution, which is basically SB 26 um, last year. So to, to only focus on one element is a problem. We need to focus on a balanced plan that can solve our problem instead of just working on one element of the problem. If, uh, and I just want to say that uh, we cannot ask Alaskans to reach in their pockets just to watch it go into these unsustainable cash subsidies to the oil industry. We just, I can't stomach that. So it all depends, as, as Representative Seaton pointed out, it all depends on a comprehensive plan. And that's why we have all of these um, working items now in finance is trying to pull it all together so that we do have a comprehensive plan that everybody would be proud and supporting and moving forward. If I might just follow up, the Senate has been clear that it does not want an income tax. So why take the heat in the House for one if it's not likely to get through on the other side? Well, that's all part of in negotiations. It's all about uh, Alaskans speaking up. And it's all about people saying, hey, public education is important to us. It's all about um, um, providing a vision, one that uh, people can make the tough decisions this year to make sure that uh, in the future we have capital budgets, in the future that uh, um, we have a vibrant university system, that we keep uh, our infrastructure in place. I mean, all of that means that we're going to have to make some tough decisions. You know, and I would frame it just a little bit differently. I would ask, why take the heat for giving the public a plan that's incomplete, a plan that leaves uh, a fairly significant deficit going forward, that depletes our primary savings account in about five or six years, provides for a nominal capital budget at a time when uh, the statewide economy is, is uh, begging for some kind of uh, infusion of, of capital, capital dollars, and uh, you know, a, a plan that um, really sort of rests on, on taking more money from, on a per capita basis from lower income Alaskans than it does from higher income Alaskans. So you know, I think our, our plan accomplishes uh, something that's more balanced and really is something that I'd be proud to present to my constituents that we've, we've got a pathway going forward. In three years, we'll have a balanced budget. Uh, hopefully in three years, we won't be having to sit down with school districts and explain why we've even further cut their resources. Um, so fundamental differences, uh, we'll sit down, we'll work our way through them at the end of the session, and uh, I'm confident we're going to come to a resolution on it. As a share of total income, I think it's worth noting that SB 26 hits the poorest Alaskans 50 times harder than it hits the richest earners in Alaska. 
And to say that the Senate's plan is a 90% plan really is a joke because it has huge gaping holes in it, and we're trying to come up with a full package. Austin Baird from KTUU. Uh, since, uh, as uh, Representative Parrish said, you're not the only group in this building, and the Senate Republicans are not the only group in this building, why not just pass the permanent fund restructure and come back to the bigger, <coughs> the bigger philosophical debate between potentially cutting 5% of government year over year and implementing uh, broad-based taxes, which it seems that has trouble even getting through the House this year, potentially. So if I understand your question right, so why not just do the easy stuff? Why not just uh, go after um, permanent funds for children and fixed income seniors, the same as we do for multimillionaires? You know, um, why? Because we want to make the tough decisions this year. We do have an election coming up next year. Um, it's going to be very difficult for the Senate to make those tough decisions. And so what are we going to do? Push it off for another three, maybe four years? No. we got to make decisions now because we're at a pivotal point to where really, um, you know, we can't predict the future, but the decisions that we make today does determine the future. And that's not the type of future that we want to see. It's just a PF, P, permanent fund only plan that taxes fixed income seniors and children the same as millionaires. And, and just to follow up, I, because I just told you that last year the House majority, the Republicans, could not even get that bill to the floor, much less have the votes on the floor to pass it. And, you know, so to now ask us to say, oh, just take that bill that, yeah, the, the Senate passed it last year and they rubber stamped it basically this year and sent it over. Uh, I appreciate the work that they did, but that bill had no support last year as a standalone piece that only hits um, Alaskans first and it only hits those uh, at the um, middle and lower incomes. Uh, you know, that's not a bill that we're, we're, our caucus is supportive of. And the majority last year was not supportive of that. So uh, to just say, why didn't you just pass the, the Senate's bill that couldn't pass last year um, is not the right question to ask. The question is, can you put together a fiscal plan that will be comprehensive and sustainable over time that will get Alaska out of this problem? I mean, we have a uh, problem with the economy. You know, we need a vibrant economy going forward, and we're not going to get there by passing something that has a $500 million deficit every year for the foreseeable future and is just spending our savings. And that we don't think that works. So why would we pass that? Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, understanding that you, you want and feel is necessary to, to do this this year, uh, are you concerned if, uh, if there was, uh, if you weren't able to reach a compromise um, and, and the same factors are at play next year, except next year is an election year, are you concerned that you run the risk of threatening a permanent fund dividends in the long run by not reaching a compromise on permanent fund dividends this year? That is the, comp the, the makeup of the legislature and who sits in the governor's chair could be different in two years. Well, I, I would say absolutely. Um, we want to have a healthy, robust dividend going well into the future. Um, but, uh, you know, an additional piece to add to your question is the fact that uh, the chief executive, i.e. the governor, has the ability to veto, um, uh, at least at this point, with a, a court case pending, so we, we can't speak too uh, definitively about things, but uh, the governor has the ability to, to uh, at this time, to veto the amount of money that the House and the Senate would put in for uh, permanent fund dividends. But, you know, if we don't sort of put a, a, a if we don't uh, construct a balanced budget, and we rely too much on, on, the, um, on the permanent fund and its earnings to fund state government going forward, uh, assuming that we can't come up with any other means, is the, the pressure going to be there on the permanent fund dividends in some shape, form, or matter? I'd say yes, it is. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. Um, are you willing to walk away if you don't get what you want this year? No. <laughs> uh, 
Becky Bohr with AP again. Um, we've talked about K-12, but not the university uh, budget. And um, the university system put out a statement last night, President Johnson calling the cuts devastating. Um, the university has adapted to the cuts in the past. Um, I'm just wondering, do you, do you share that sentiment, or do you believe that they can sort of adapt and keep going with what this level of, of cut would be? Well, part of the message I think the President put out was the fact that they hadn't been consulted, if I understood his message correctly. So with 12 days uh, or so remaining in a 90-day session, um, I think that this uh, reduction that the Senate is proposing caught them just completely off guard. And uh, there was a really good editorial in the dispatch the, this morning by Fran Almer that talked about uh, some $73 million worth of reduction in the last few years, really the role of the university in the broader economy, uh, everything from research to jobs to attracting federal monies to um, uh, you know, the rural campuses and so on and so forth. So uh, again, it comes back down to that theme. Are we willing to sort of uh, eat our seed corn at this point uh, in lieu of not making tough choices, asking Alaskans uh, to, uh, to pay fairly modest amounts so we can keep these services intact and keep the state uh, going forward, um, you know, some bare six or seven years into our second 50-year uh, period of statehood. And I may just follow up that, you know, one of the things that the university talked about is the Senate's elimination, basically, of the Alaska Performance Scholarship. And which is a big attractor for the university. They're looking about 5,000 students that um, have come through that program to stay in state for the university. And it's just kind of um, mystifying why the one program that we put in place uh, in 2012 that has had great benefits, that has uh, students better prepared going into school, that have students taking four years of math now instead of one year of math or two years of math that they need to graduate with. You know, all of those things are tremendous benefits. And, and the idea that we haven't seen increases in education is it's just not there. I mean, between 2012 and 2016, the graduation rate is up 6.5 percent statewide. Now, that's the entire state. That's hard to do. And there has to be something that is um, dr making that draw so that we have a higher graduation rate. And that's students being better prepared and getting there. And so um, I, I think it is. Um, not a responsible thing to do to take the one innovation that we have made in this state that ha has actually had uh, great success in changing high school and college attendance rates um, and doing away with it uh, for some supposed uh, new um, innovation grants that might be funded in the future. I, I just don't think that that's a responsible way to do. There are, are a lot of extremely successful programs throughout our state, and it's been shown by a, a Nobel laureate that investments, particularly in early education, can have a 17-fold return on investment. But those are on the, the block right now. That sort of thing is being attacked, and we need the people throughout Alaska, we need every Alaskan calling their senator, calling their representative, and demanding a comprehensive fiscal plan which protects our most important investments, our investments in education, in our children. Um, Nat Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. What happens if uh, House Bill 115 does not pass the House? Well, certainly uh, there are other vehicles in play. Senate Bill 26 is in the House Finance Committee. Um, we have uh, an additional revenue measure that's in the Finance Committee as well. Um, so I, I think there's uh, a, a number of pathways that could be taken uh, uh, for, uh, uh, can be taken advantage of to go forward here. So um, uh, you know, put a lot of time in the House Bill 115. Um, the co-chair here can certainly speak to the details. Uh, probably ad nauseum on the bill, <laughs> but uh, 
the, the fact is that uh, uh, we've left our options open, and uh, I would hope the Senate uh, is willing to do the same. And, and our, you know, one of our pillars there is a broad-based tax. The income tax is the one that we think is most balanced uh, across the in income segments in Alaska. But, you know, nobody has brought forward a state sales tax, generally because it doesn't work unless it's uncapped and it, it goes across all services. It's a, it's a uh, sales or uh, use fee. Uh, which means anything you bring into the state, you're going to pay basically 4% of the total value on. And when businesses find that out, they really think that that's not the way to go either. They think that income tax, once they look and compare the two, but nobody has put that on the table because it has such um, harmful consequences for all our municipalities that have sales taxes as well as for businesses once they realize that it would have to be 4% uncapped on all services and sales, including real estate and including financial services, um, all of those things. So to, to generate an equivalent amount of money. And so that's a kind of a regressive tax because it comes up front before anybody makes any money on uh, the equipment they bought to pursue um, whatever uh, job they're doing. So we have time for one more. Uh, James Brooks from the Juno Empire again. Uh, last week we heard some of the senators go up to Fairbanks and go up to Anchorage and I believe the expression that I heard in one of the presentations was mic drop if they didn't get what they wanted. And so I'm kind of curious, if you're not willing to walk away, does that put you at a disadvantage in negotiations? Well, you know, we've said repeatedly that the big difference from last year to this year is that really across the sort of political spectrums in the capital that uh, uh, the resolve to make significant decisions, I believe, is there. The House, the Senate, the majority, the minority caucuses, um, so I'm going on good faith going forward. Um, I'm not pessimistic. I'm optimistic that we are going to arrive at a compromise. I know there are major differences now, but really, why wouldn't there be major differences? These are really difficult choices, uh, choices of, uh, you know, perhaps once in a generation or more in the legislature. We haven't had to face the fact that Alaskans uh, have not uh, had to pay a tax for some 40 years, uh, you know, up until the last couple of years, going into the permanent fund. Uh, making uh, tough decisions about the budget. So, um, you know, sure you're going you're gonna to hear uh, 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 sort of uh, emphatic statements from the uh, Senate coalition, uh, Senate uh, caucus as well, from the, uh, our side as well. But um, again, uh, the Senate president uh, and myself and the other principals, majority leader, the co-chairs of the Finance Committee, we're all talking to our counterparts. Uh, we're all, um, I, I think, ultimately, um, uh, you know, committed to doing what it takes to move Alaska into the future. And, and again, that's the key thing, moving Alaska into the future. Um, uh, big decisions this year. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking about this at our, our press availability next week. So I'm going to use that as an opportunity to thank you all for being here this morning, a little bit earlier than usual. And uh, appreciate your time, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.